Good afternoon, boys and girls. Mrs. Leapheart here. Um, coming to you to read our next chapter of Gordon Corman's The Hypnotist. Um, we just had some interesting stuff come to light with um, our friend Jack's opus. He... Um, He was at the doctor's office the last time and um, for the for his eyes because his mom's worried about his eye changing color and how that might affect his vision and his dad says that his uncle did the same thing and um, people called him kind of crazy so we're on chapter four um, bear with me the wind hopefully um, stays calm enough that it doesn't overpower and you can still hear me there were framed diplomas from Harvard, Oxford, and the University of Vienna next to a signed black and white photograph of Sigmund Freud himself, the father of modern psychoanalysts. Dr. Gunnenberg was the top child psychiatrist in New York and the most expensive. No one batted an eye when one of his patients arrived in a Bentley. Mom might have told Jax not to worry, but the fact that the family was willing to blow this much money on a shrink for their son, son showed Jax that plenty, was wor plenty of worrying was going on somewhere. However, Dr. Gutenberg charged. However much G Dr. Gutenberg charged, Jax was sure it was a ripoff. He tried repeatedly to explain about his visions. Yet all the psychiatrists wanted to talk about were his dreams. But Dr. Gutenberg, he protested, there are no problems with my dreams. I dream great. It's when I'm awake that the trouble starts. Your dreams hold a key to your subconscious mind, young Jackson. Dr. Gutenberg didn't seem to didn't seem foreign, but he spoke with a phony accent. It was almost as if he thought he was a better psychiatrist psychiatrist if he sounded like Freud, in addition to being the guy's number one fan. Yes, but can your subconscious mind make you see yourself from 30 feet away? Jack persisted. Dr. Gutenberg leaned into Jack's face with the light shining off his forehead, which extended all the way back over his bald crown down to his starched collar. Clearly, it is physically impossible to be in a position to observe oneself from a distance. Jack bristled. Are you saying I'm lying? There's no lying in this office. Even when you speak an untruth, deeper truths reveal it to me. Like what? The doctor rubbed his endless forehead. If you choose to see yourself from the perspective of another, this may indicate that you are unsure of who you are. He leaned in farther. Don't answer. Your conscious mind is not capable of observing the big picture. Now, listen. So Jax listened and kept on listening, but Dr. Gutenberg wasn't saying anything. The psychiatrist had lapsed into silence, his huge bald head barely eight inches away, blotted blotting out the diplomas and most of the rest of the room. Right there in the office where he'd gone to make his vision stop, he had another one. This was a close-up vivid enough for him to make out his eyes wide with outrage and the color of amethyst crystal. It was the last straw, 400 bucks an hour to get hit with the problem in the middle of what was supposed to take care of the cure, supposed to be the cure. And what did this guy have to offer? Dead air. It's happening, Jack breathed, right now honest. The doctor made no reply, not a sound, barely a twitch. Was he even listening? Exasperated, Jax made a play for the man's attention. I'm jumping out the window now, doc. Still nothing better. Still, you jump out the window. Without a word, Dr. Gutenberg left his chair and began to walk away. Jax saw red. Hey, remember me? I'm the paying customer. I'm still here, you know. He watched open mouth as the psychiatrist rolled up the blinds, opened the window, and threw a leg over the sill. The cry that burst from Jax was barely human. What are you doing? He sprang over, grasped the man's arm, and held on with a grip like a steel vice. In the blink of an eye, this appointment had changed from boring and overpriced an hour to nothing less than a tug of war with death, and death was winning. The doctor resisted, straining ever closer to the tipping point. We're on the 35th floor. But that didn't seem to register with Dr. Gutenberg. He was determined to take a flying leap. Jax dug his sneakers into the carpet and began to haul the psychiatrist back from the brink, pulling with all his strength at the man's shoulders, his sleeves, his cuff, anything that might keep him inside the office. In answer, Dr. Butensburg shrugged out of his blazer, freeing himself from his patient's grasp, and began to roll his body over the sill. 
It was too late. In seconds, he'd be falling. Jack squeezed his eyes shut in an attempt to banish thoughts of the hurtling descent, the upward rush of the pavement below. No, he howled. Stop! With that, Dr. Gutenberg stepped back into the office. Brushing off his immaculate white shirt, he accepted his blazer from his trembling patient and sat back down in the chair as if nothing had happened. Are you all right? Jack barely whispered. Certainly, the doctor replied. But I see that our time is up. We will continue this next week. If you haven't killed yourself by then, the psychiatrist looked shocked. Young Jackson, why would you even suggest a thing like that? Jax just stared. Could it possibly tr be true that this man honestly didn't remember the horrible thing he just tried to do? Could a, an event like that really slip a guy's mind? First, Dr. Paloma, and now this. There was only one conclusion that Jax could draw. He'd always assumed that his hallucinations, hallucinations were his problem alone. But now people around him were doing crazy things. There had to be a connection. Was there something about this strange vision that was making others act in a way even stranger? You're so clueless, Opus, Tommy told him at school the next day. Everybody's a little weird around you. It's been happening since kindergarten. The two seventh graders were navigating the halls en route to the cafeteria. Nobody's ever climbed over a 35th windowsill, Jax insisted. My parents said he was using some kind of shock therapy, but I think he was serious. If I hadn't grabbed his arm, he'd be a grease spot on Park Avenue. Yeah, that's pretty bugging, Tommy admitted, but people are different with you. It's like there are two sets of rules in the world, one for you and one for the rest of us. Name one time that that's ever happened, Jax demanded. How about Stedman? The kid's an animal, averaging 40 points a game all season, but then he comes up against you and he can't hit the broad side of a barn. Maybe I played him tough, Jack suggested. Maybe he had an off game. Anything's possible. I guess Tommy looks skeptical. skeptical. But don't you think it's strange that you're on student council? Lots of people are on student council. Yeah, because they ran for office. You never did, but enough kids wrote your name that you got elected. They thought I could do a good job? Jax offered lamely. Right, just like the debate team, which you never tried out for either. You stink at debating, man. How about the one time you said we all should be vegetarians, and if people lose their jobs in the meat industry... Okay, so that wasn't my finest hour, Jax conceded. Remember what you said, Tommy crowed? Your amazing ar argument that crushed the other side with its sheer brilliance and logic? You said that if people get laid off... At the slaughterhouse, it's no biggie because all they have to do is buy a bag of seeds and start farming. Jack finally finished along with his friend. It was the only thing I could think of. Besides, we won the debate. That's my whole point, Tommy exclaimed. Everybody in that room was staring at you like you just solved the world's problems. They always do. People don't stare at me. Hi, Jacks. Brown-haired, petite Jessica Cruz walked up to them. While she stood equally distant from both, both of them, it was obvious that all her attention was fo focused on Jax. Tommy mouthed the word, staring. Jax lowered his eyes from her gaze. Hi, Jess. How's it going? Do you want to be my bus partner on the field trip tomorrow? She asked. As part of a unit on the Roaring Twenties, the seventh grade social studies class was scheduled to attend a reenactment of a genuine show. He's already got a bus partner, Tommy put in. For the first time, Jessica seemed to notice him. Oh, hey, Tommy. Back at Jack's. Well, if he gets sick or something, come and find me. She disappeared into the cafeteria. You see, Tommy was triumphant. Might as well have been a cockroach on a locker. Jax took a deep breath. Okay, so it happens sometimes. The question is, why? That's an easy one, Tommy said confidently. It's because you were born with a giant horseshoe up your diaper. You're a lucky man. Yeah, right. That's why I ended with a psychiatrist who's nuttier than I am. Seriously, everything goes your way. If you weren't my best friend, I'd hate your guts. Why look for reasons? Just sit back and enjoy it. Except that I'm seeing things and the people around me are freaking me out. I'm not freaking out and I'm around you 24-7. I guess I'm just more stable than everybody else. They entered the cafeteria and headed for the lunch line. At least a dozen people waved and called, Hi, Jax. There wasn't a single, Hi, Tommy. Tommy took a mock bow. I'm here too. To Jax, he said, maybe they're just checking you out to see what color your eyes are today. But it doesn't work on me because it's all gray. Jax helped himself to some mashed potatoes. And that's when you're the one who understands why you can't start farming in a 10th floor apartment because you're colorblind. 
Tommy deposited a dollar p dollop of potatoes on his tray and licked the scoop before returning it. Nope, it's because I'm gifted. Pass the pepper. All right, that was chapter four. We will um, do chapter five tomorrow, which by looking at the weather means I will be inside. Um, remember, if you are enjoying this book, you can um, follow me on YouTube so that you can continuously get the updates of um, the chapters when they're on there. Bye, guys. Miss you.